This is a story of the largest ranch in Hayes County, Texas, and the founding family who ran it for more than 60 years. The Kirkendall clan came to Texas with Stephen F. Austin as part of the old 300, the original Anglo settlers in Texas. By the early 1820s, the family had large land holdings near the Texas coast. They fought and died in Indian battles, the Texas War for Independence, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, and drove large herds of Texas Longhorns from San Antonio to Kansas City. Our story begins at the end of the 19th century with the marriage of Gil and Maggie Kirkendall in 1890. At their wedding, Zach Miller, the owner of the famous 101 Ranch in Oklahoma, gave them a wedding present, the 101 Cattle Brand, for their use in Texas. The original 101 name came from a saloon in San Antonio at 101 East 2nd Street, where all the cowboys would spend one last night before the long trail ride to Kansas. Gil Kirkendall immediately started putting the 101 brand on his horses and cattle. In 1902, he decided to move operations to Central Texas and purchased 11,073 acres west of Buda. This just over 17 square mile property on Onion Creek on some of the most scenic land in Texas became the 101. A large two-story wooden ranch house headquarters was built to serve as a family homestead. Gil died in 1905, and Maggie was left with four children, Marion, Dorothy, Wiley, and Ike, not to mention hundreds of head of cattle, goats, sheep, and horses. Maggie hired Joe and Will Cruz from Wimberley to help run the ranch. Maggie spinster her aunt, Eudora Moore, who lived with the family at 101 Ranch, kept a daily diary of the goings-on for the next 30 years. She wrote the daily diaries in the Moore family's insurance business calendars. So when Maggie Moore uh, Kirkendall, married to Gill, moved up here in 1901 to take over and took over the ranch, her aunt, old maid aunt Eudora Inez Moore, came up to stay with her and stayed with her for the rest of her life until she died in 1933. And she wrote, uh, uh, she wrote a daily diary. And we have all of them except the ones, God damn it, that Aunt Dorothy threw away because she didn't want us to read about half of them, and she threw everything away after dad married my mother who was his second wife aunt dorothy didn't like that and she found the box full of those diaries that were written in little there were there were all insurance ledgers little ledgers she threw away 19 26 27 28 and 29 but at least i have 30 31 32 and 33 and i have from 1901 to 1926 half of one of them july 10 1906 the hands all started off this morning. They're going to help gather cattle. Will and Joe Cruz helping Maggie. Baby got sick this morning, high fever. July 13, 1906. They ship the cattle, 350 head of steers today. October 15, 1908. The telephone men got the wire up to the house Friday. They took dinner, stayed all night, three of them. Maggie bought the phone box out from town, but there is no connection with Kyle. But they can hear people in Dripping Springs 15 miles away. We never can have a day to ourselves anymore. May 6th, 1910, Maggie, Joe, Wiley went out all the morning collecting cattle to sell to the Kyle Butcher. I got dinner again. We had three extra men for supper looking at horses who are staying the night. 
was so tired I had to lie down to rest, as I do most every day now. It never ends here. Everyone at the ranch made numerous trips a week to Kyle on horseback or in a buggy for supplies or to catch the numerous trains to San Marcos or Austin. The train trips were mostly to see doctors or purchase large items. In her diary, Aunt Dora points out that these excursions, which often were overnight in a hotel, cost less than $5 for the train, hotel, and meals combined. October 6, 1911. Dorothy, Wiley, and Joe Cruz went to Austin this morning to attend Ringling Brothers Circus. It's an awfully hot day. Will it never rain and get cool, I wonder? October 24, 1911. Maggie and I are on train to San Marcos. Saw the airship on Sunday morning. There was a great crowd out to see it. Some had come in autos. Our world is changing. By 1912, the 101 Ranch had an auto as part of its transportation needs. They still traveled mostly by horseback, wagon, or buggy, and had to constantly deal with high water on Onion Creek that would prevent any crossing. The average time for a trip to Kyle was two hours one way. November 27, 1914. Joe and Wiley took some horses to be inspected as to their fitness for war horses to be used in the European war. They decided not to sell. June 10, 1915. Mr. Dodge and Mr. Bass are here tonight. Dorothy went to the train to meet them. Marion went to meet the mail rider. Tom Johnson and Duggar came to spend the week. They come, they go, with never a let up. March 1, 1916. Maggie had electric lights put in last week, one in every room. They are fine, and that does away with lamp cleaning and trimming. March 9, 1916. Dorothy took me to Austin to see Birth of the Nation at the moving picture show. I thought it grand and it was taken from the Klansman. The 101 provided well for the family. Some sections of ranch land were leased for cattle grazing. Cattle were raised and sold on a constant basis to markets in St. Louis, Kansas City, and San Antonio. And horses were sold to other ranches and the U.S. Army in Texas. The 101 had thousands of livestock spread throughout its acreage. The cattle were rounded up and walked to Kyle to be loaded on a train for shipping. September 21. 1916. Dorothy took Maggie and I to see the soldiers who were camped on the Blanco. There were 15,000 of them. Infantry, cavalry, artillery, wagons, trucks, etc. I have not seen so many troops since the Civil War. October 19, 1918. The folks had to go to Buda in the buggy as the batteries in the car were dead. There is so much sickness there that it is bad for them to be there. I have never seen so many people with the flu. It seems to be everywhere. Aunt Dora may not have known that she was seeing just a small portion of the worldwide flu epidemic that killed between 20 and 40 million during the two-year outbreak. It was circulated throughout the world by soldiers returning from World War I. December 3, 1918. Maggie and Dorothy drove to San Marcos today to stop and see Herbert Wisnant. 
He is home from France, but left his leg over there. In 1919, Maggie decided that most of the family needed to seek California. She loads three of her children, Marion, Dorothy, and Ike, along with Aunt Dora, into their Model T and heads west in the summer. This is before highways, road maps, and service stations were plentiful. They made low water crossings and repaired their own flats. The trip took them 21 days. They rent a house in Pasadena and enroll Ike in school. They were there, most of them, for a total of nine months. September 1, 1919. Went to Long Beach today. Dorothy went in bathing, saw hundreds of people in very scant attire. They were so thick, one could scarcely walk for them. March 18, 1920. Dorothy and myself went to Los Angeles today. We were looking for a tailor establishment. Went up and down the streets, ran out of gas, took two trips to get the car enough and to get started. I think I have had enough of the city to last me for some time. Marion decides to take the train to Cleveland after she hears from Dr. Lester Taylor, who had returned with the army from Europe. She and Lester got married and lived in Cleveland. During the trip to California, Wiley, age 20, had been left behind to run the ranch. Many letters are exchanged between Wiley and his family, and he says things are not going well at home. Maggie takes a train back to Texas and stays three months. Wiley wants to see California too, and drives himself and Maggie back across country in his flivver to Los Angeles. He attaches longhorns to the hood. They survive the trip. Wiley meets a young silent film star, Marjorie Honey, and invited her back with him to Texas. He gives her the family diamond ring. It doesn't go quite as expected. And the girl was sitting up on the fence, watching them work cattle, and dropped the diamond ring off in the pen on top of the cattle. Well, about two days later of her going around the house like this, finally Daddy, Dad being rather abrupt and rather abrasive and rather whatever Dad was, extremely male chauvinist, finally just that blankety blankety blank, what the hell have you done? And she started squalling and yelling that she had lost the ring with Dad being very, uh, pr very uh, uh, protective of her and all that kicked her in the ash, threw her goddamn clothes in a suitcase, hauled her in the butter, threw her on the train, and shipped her butt back to California. Ran back out to the house, jerked the screen door off the goddamn old house out there, got him a shovel and a wheelbarrow, and literally went out there and shoveled that whole goddamn pen and did the shaking and found the diamond ring. Aunt Dora and Ike are invited to Cleveland to live with Marion and Lester Taylor. Ike graduates from high school there. April 22nd, 1921. Dorothy sent a telegram the first of the week stating that Wiley and Mildred Williams from Lockhart were married Sunday. 
June 26, 1921. Well, old diary, lots of things have happened the past week. Dorothy was married Wednesday at 1.30 to Lawrence Hoskins. He's a widower with three children, little girls. Dorothy sure has her hands full to overflowing. During the early 1920s, all of the cattle and horses at the ranch needed to be dipped in a tick eradication solution. This led to large cattle roundups, with many hands hired to get the cattle dipped. It was a massive operation. All of the ranchers in Texas had to dip their cattle in an arsenic solution every two weeks for the next several years. The price on cattle dropped during this period from near $100 a head to $14 a head. July 8, 1921. They collected cattle yesterday and dipped a bunch of steers, which they shipped this morning. Three carloads have been collecting and dipping cattle all day. We had 11 men to dinner and nearly as many for supper yesterday. Had 10 besides Maggie and myself today. Maggie got up at 4 a.m. this morning and nearly that early yesterday. This is a tired lot on this place. July 9, 1921. The men worked till night dipping cattle and horses, dipped in over 900 head of cattle, nearly a thousand with the steers they shipped. The well got out of order. It is hot. September 21. 1921. Ike left last night for school at A&M. He helped collect cattle all day. Has a new suit of blue clothes and looked real handsome. Hope he will spend a pleasant and comfortable year at College Station. We will miss him like everything. His bed looked lonely last night. Lawrence Hoskins family ran a store in Gonzales and he and Dorothy spend a lot of time going back and forth from the 101 to Gonzales. Dorothy adds to their family in November 1922 with the birth of Worth Hoskins. Lawrence decides to go in with Maggie and Dorothy in setting up a meat market store in Buda to sell fresh meat from the 101. Wiley also gets involved in the market and cattle are slaughtered at the ranch and hauled to Buda two or three times a week. July 6, 1923. Wiley stopped here this morning on his way to Buda. He wants to work in the market. I certainly wish he was dependable. The years 1923 and 1924 see more cattle dipping. Strain in the family between the Hoskins and the Kirkendalls, nonstop visits to the ranch by folks from throughout Central Texas, and Wiley divorcing Mildred in 1925. Wiley decides to remarry in July 1926 and picks a 15-year-old girl named Alice Hamlet. This provides another round of family discussions as Alice is banned from the dining room for meals at the 101. Uh, mother met. Dad would horseback into Lockhart. Lockhart, he said, was where all the pretty women were and he would horseback from the ranch down there and go to all the parties and jazz around with the women. And he met this 15-year-old girl who was strikingly beautiful, about nearly six feet tall, who was my mother. Uh, and a few months later, they were married without anybody's permission in San Marcos at the judge, 
and there's no way you can get that done, so you tell me how they did it. Well, a very prominent family, Daddy went, Daddy went down there and told the judge to get his ass in there and, and marry him, and they did it. What everybody found out about it, they all had a wall-eyed fit, especially Grandmother Hamlin in Austin. <laughs> so uh, my Aunt Korea and her much older sister was had been married forever to an army officer, World War One, World War Two, World War One. So Corinne comes up from their station, their station in Panama, and gets her 16-year-old sister, who's married to some wild-ass rancher that the, the Kirkendalls didn't like any more than anybody else did, and hauls her butt to Panama on the on the first banana boat out of New Orleans. <laughs> Wiley pursues Alice to Panama, finds her, and they return to the 101 Ranch. Wiley and Alice are married for the rest of their lives and have two sons, Gil and Marshall. In the summer of 1929, Wiley hits upon the idea of having the 101 Ranch put on the Kirkendall Rodeo. He sells ads to the local stores in Buda and runs an ad in the Austin paper inviting the public to the ranch for the first rodeo on October 5th, through the summer of 1930. Then Wiley decides to get involved in polo. It seems like a great idea in the middle of a national depression, but Wild Bill Wiley has now changed his name to Bill, which he will use for the rest of his life, knows a lot about horses and how to ride. He sells his horses after each tournament, pockets the money, and gets another set of horses ready from the ranch. Bill helps form the Woodlawn Polo Club in Austin and started the Weston Field Polo Club. Bill was a cowboy who spent the week roping bulls and living on horseback, so polo was just a game that he happened to play very well. Bill plays polo for the next 10 years throughout the United States and Mexico. Dad, of course, he was a cattleman, but he also, during the 30s, he, he was a professional polo player because they'd hire him to come play polo. He started out in, in the I think 1929 and 30, he was in Boston. Then from there, he went to Cleveland, Ohio. Then in the middle 30s, he went to Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, not all year round, but I remember going on a train. It was 1937 or 8, the Mexican government invited the United States team to come to Mexico City to play exhibitions and dad was on the international team so we rode the train to Mexico City and I'll, I'll never forget it was a it was a fine time January 1 1932. This has been a bright, sunny day, cool enough to be pleasant. I've kept the diary so long that it's become a habit with me. I should be lost without it. April 11, 1932. Bill and Herman Greenhall left for Boston today with nine horses to play another tournament. 
Marion is divorced from Dr. Taylor in 1932 and leaves for Europe to recover. She actually becomes very ill with pneumonia in Florence, and Maggie travels to Europe and brings her home to the 101 in 1933. I don't think that anybody really uh, takes into consideration uh, my great aunt Marion Kirkendall, Dottie's sister and Bill's sister and Ike's sister. Uh, Auntie, as I called her, as I grew up knowing her, in fact, I believe I was supposed to have been named after her, but she told them when I was born, don't name her Marion, I guess because she didn't want to jinx me, but uh, I was supposed to have been named in her honor. And so they decided on Marianne instead of Marion. And uh, she was quite a lady. She had had a very colorful life. She was married to Dr. Taylor. I believe they were in Ohio. And I'm not sure what happened to that marriage, but I believe they were divorced. And this was probably back in the 30s, maybe. And uh, she went to Europe. And I'm not sure what happened to her, but she contracted some illness. And the fever was so high. And back in those days in, in Italy, I'm not sure you know about the hospitals, but she lost all of her hair from this horrible fever. And I think she was delirious for quite some time. And, and uh, grandmother, grandmother's mother, Maggie Kirkendall, uh, went over there on a boat and stayed with her until she recovered and then brought her back to Texas. But she almost died. And I'm not sure what from, but it, whatever it was, it was, it was very unusual that she lived through it. But she was not all there after that, so to speak. And she lived on her part of the ranch, which was a lot smaller than, than say, Dottie's part or Bill's part. And uh, she was a very unique person. Aunt Dora dies on November 8, 1933. She was 86 and had spent her life helping Maggie run the 101, cook meals and clean for hundreds of guests, look after the animals and help educate the children. She had written over 450 pages of diary entries covering the 101 from 1902. Maggie decides that now is the time to divide the 101 among her children. So in 1933, they broke the ranch up among the family members. Ike got the north two or 3,000 acres. Marion got a middle pasture of 500 acres. She got the south pasture down and what we call the lock on what is now 150, which was the Kyle to Driftwood Road. She got 1,500 acres down there. Dorothy kept the 1,800 acres where the old headquarters house was. Dad got 1,800 acres over on, he got all of the main part of Onion Creek, which is now the headquarters portion of Mike Rutherford. I seemed to get the most because he had no creek, don't ask me, because everybody else had part of the creek, but Ike had the north part of the range. I believe that Dorothy, uh, even though all of them were ranch people, I, I believe that Dorothy was the best rancher of all of them. My father was a pure showman. Everything was for show for my father. Uh, he wanted to be on stage every kind of way he could. Uh, 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 Ike is non, nondescript. That's the younger brother. Marion, very attractive, and she was a recluse, never spoke to anyone, didn't speak to my mother for over 20 years until a horse hit her in the head and she was unconscious for 31 days. And when she woke up, she spoke to Alice, my mother. <laughs> so that kind of cured her. But anyway, she was not the rancher. The ranchers were Ike and Dorothy and my father, Bill, but the real rancher of the family, I'm just, from a conservative standpoint, probably was Dorothy. 
Dorothy divorces Lawrence Hoskins in 1935 and moves into the main ranch house with Maggie and assumes day-to-day operation of the 101. Dorothy was a, she was a goat getter. I mean, she was a tough old gal, and she'd cut the sailor off a boat. I mean, she gets you told right quick, but I loved her. She was a lot of fun, and, uh, and she more or less ran the ranch. Uh, I don't know what caused their divorce. Interestingly, now you know what a taboo divorce was in America and wherever we are in the early, 19, early 1900s. All of the Kirkendall family got divorced. That should tell you something about the genetics or the background or how crazy in the hell they are. But every one of them got divorced. And I find that most extraordinary when I sit down and start writing history about it that, that Marion, Dorothy, Bill, and Ike all got divorced in the early days. Although reduced in size, the 101 continues large cattle operations and attracts the interest of the U.S. Army to create a large military base at the beginning of World War II. I came home one day, mother was upstairs crying, and I'm... What, I'm 10, 10 years old, I guess. And what I, th- this is what I heard. So the Army, now Dad's been playing with the Army. So Dad played, played polo against all, all the, uh, Army was cavalry. So Dad played against them all through the 30s. He knew everybody at Fort Sam Houston uh, and down there. So somehow they start coming up on the ranch to help uh, photograph and to plant seeds and some bullshit that they were talking to. Daddy was, Daddy was kind of the outgoing one. He was, he was the one they would approach, uh, and because of his polo days. Uh, and what they were doing, they were mapping the Kirkendall Ranch and others to condemn it for, a, for Fort Hood. It was all created because Lyndon wanted this massive base next to, to San Marcos to benefit San Marcos. But the word I got from Dad was that an Army officer at the Corps that he knew from polo days was to block it. And Dad was very proud of the fact that it was the only place in the country that once it had been condemned, they couldn't take it. And he hated Lyndon Johnson for the rest of his life. Wouldn't ever speak about him, wouldn't talk to him, but anything over that condemnation. Maggie Kirkendall died on January 4th, 1950, and was buried in the 101 Ranch Mausoleum. She had spent 45 years keeping the 101 in operation. Worth Hoskins marries Elizabeth Engelhorn, and they move into the main ranch house and help Dorothy run the 101. Well, after I got married, then I moved out there to the house, and Dottie had to put up with a daughter-in-law who had never cooked never really done any housework much. I used to ride a lot horseback, but then, uh, and I loved animals. And so she was sweet enough to put up with me. And I had to learn to get up at crack of dawn or before, make coffee, make, well, at that time I didn't make breakfast because I didn't know how. And she would come in the kitchen and make breakfast and uh, was always nice, happy, never grumpy in the morning. And uh, she just went through the kitchen like a whirlwind and out the door she'd go and she'd be out either in the garden or working cows or riding on the horse. There was always, always something to do. Worth and Elizabeth have three children at the ranch. Uh, It was for a child, or I guess even an adult, it was just like paradise. Uh, We were allowed to run free and do just about anything we could do. Uh, I rode horseback, I guess, since I was maybe uh, two years old. I rode horseback everywhere. Uh, it was really 
probably one of the most beautiful ranches, I thought, in uh, Central Texas. My grandmother, Dorothy Hoskins, uh, she absolutely adored uh, all livestock, uh, especially horses. Horses were her love, and uh, she just absolutely was enamored with horses. Cattle came second, but the horses were her love, and she's the one that encouraged me to ride. And my mother, uh, Elizabeth Hoskins, was a, a wonderful rider, and uh, she enjoyed horses too, so it came naturally, you know, from both women since we all lived in the same big house that, uh, you know, that was part of growing up. I remember, it's interesting because I remember her smell. Uh, one thing, uh, she was probably one of the hardest working women I have ever seen in my life. I mean, in, uh, not in the house as much, it was all physical. Everything she did, she basically did by herself, or she had uh, the wonderful man that worked with her, uh, L.D. Bunton, a uh, Negro man from Buda. And if L.D. wasn't there to help her feed or, or whatever needed to be done, she did it on her own. And sometimes my father was there and he, he would help, but it was mostly uh, grandmother and L.D. And of course, that was back in the days, you know, when didn't have much for deodorant. <laughs> and, you know, hard work, you, you smell it on your clothes and, and you give her a big hug and, and, you know, you could smell she'd been working pretty hard that day. You know, really, when you think about my grandmother's life from beginning to end, the changes that she saw in the world, she went from horse and buggy, literally, to Model T, to the cars of the 30s and 40s and 50s. She saw the airplane come into being. She saw NASA and the space exploration. She saw all of these wonderful things in her lifetime that I don't know that any of us will ever experience these great changes as she was able to experience in, in her life. Grandmother and uh, Dorothy Kirkendall and Winnie Phillips were set on having the best herd of cattle that they could possibly put together. And I believe in my mind that they were way, way ahead of their time because the result of these matings, we had the most beautiful ball-faced heifer calves that you have ever seen. They were just like little china dolls. They were just gorgeous. And they turned into some absolutely beautiful cows. And they did exactly what Dottie, my grandmother, thought that they would do. One thing that I distinctly remember of course, whenever she was working cattle, I was kind of like a puppy dog. I was right there with her. She had the cattle inspector and a buyer come out to look at the calves that she'd sorted off to sell. Well, at the end of the day, when they got through and decided on the price, the buyer was going to offer her less, but I have always believed that my grandmother had the hardest time ranching because men would take advantage. She had no other real outlet to sell her cattle. You know, you couldn't haul them. They, we didn't have any way to haul them to town, to the auction. Uh, they would take advantage of, of her being in the country and nobody to back her up and say no y'all are cheating her by not offering her more for those calves. They're a lot better than what you're paying her for them by the pound. But I always felt like she was being really taken advantage of because she was a woman and by herself. Living there was one of these childhood dreams. I mean, to me, you could not pay me. Well, they had to bribe me to get me to leave the ranch. Honestly, if they got to go to the doctor, to go to town at all, they had to say, I'll buy you a little soldier if you'll go to town with us. And, all right, I'll go. But that's the only way they could get me to leave the ranch. Uh, and it was idyllic. I mean, for a little bitty child to be growing up in that situation. And, of course, I was the baby of the family, which meant I got special attention. And I guess I must have known that subconsciously because I could get away with murder and my grandmother would save me.
So I would aggravate my brother T, who tried to murder me, and then we'd run around that big house, around and around about three times until I couldn't run any farther, and then I'd run into the kitchen, and my grandmother would save me from my brother beating me to death. And I religiously would do that. I'm, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say that she saved me all the time, but that's the way it was done. That's one of the first horses that I had. And so, he, he's the one that broke my neck. But other than that, <laughs> yeah, you live with horses, you tend to have things happen. But old oh, Billy had a problem with that. Uh, you'd be trailing out, going out to pasture to gather the cattle and uh, riding along, and he'd see a tree and he'd scrape you off. He'd dodge over and scrape you off. And Daddy got rid of him after he ran me under that tree. <laughs> There's an oak tree that grew over the road, and we're all running out. To, I was trying to catch up for the rest of them. We're working cattle and going out into the, what they call the Heimer pasture. And there's, of course, the oak trees grew out and grew over the road, and you would go around it. Well, I was going around with, going around it, and he decided to go duck under it. And uh, I can still feel that. <laughs> it still hurts on my temple of my head where he scraped me off. And uh, my brother said, it's just like in the cartoons. You just slow motion. You kind of hung there in the air before you hit the ground. Well, one of the important things that affected our life as children was Onion Creek. I mean, during the time when we weren't in a drought, that creek was running beautiful, clear water. Uh, at that time, there were no houses along the creek at all, Onion Creek. And in my, my memory, uh, Dottie and all of us would head down to the falls to go swimming on the hot summer days. We weren't allowed to go f swimming until my mother had shot all the water moccasins in the waterfall. And there were a lot of water moccasins because they would sit on the edge of the waterfall in a pile of rocks. And they'd come out of those pile of rocks on the other side of the creek and come in and get fish out of the waterfall. Well, she would stand there with her little 22 and pistol and on one side of the creek and shoot all the water moccasins. And then they say, OK, it's safe to go in. And then we'd go swimming. Dorothy continues the 101 tradition of being the center for drop-in guests, parties, and supper. There was a never-ending cycle of visitors from Austin, Buda, the next ranch, San Antonio, and lots of family. Dorothy had grown up with this environment for the past 50 years and was always ready with frozen daiquiris and a glad welcome. She enjoyed cooking and after a day herding cattle would host the dinner party. The ranch's reputation as the 101 Hilton never faded. Dorothy and the Hoskins family continued working the 101 until the mid-1960s. By then, large tracks owned by the various family members had been sold off to Houston oil man Pat Rutherford. He owned all but the last 2,500 acres that Dorothy had kept with the main ranch house. Taxes had continued to increase, and finally a deal was made for Rutherford to purchase the last of the remaining 101. Dorothy retained a life estate on the ranch house and kept that until her death in 1986. Her ashes were spread on the 101 Ranch Mausoleum. Rutherford disregarded the main ranch house, and it has crumbled. The city of Austin bought this section of the ranch from Rutherford to preserve it as a watershed protection area for Barton Springs. The 101 is now divided into numerous private ranches, none in the hands of the Kirkendall family or the Hoskins. 
the largest cattle ranch in Hayes County, run by strong women and their children from the Kirkendall family, has passed into history.